just I'm just like absolutely excited and stunned to be doing this with you. You're so gorgeous and amazing. <laughs> I understand why he wanted you to do the intro. I feel so good already. We haven't even started. <laughs> the following program is rated BBMALSA. It contains strong language, sexual situations, awesomeness, and nudity. It is intended only for mature audiences. Listener indiscretions are advised. Welcome to our Bliss Bringers podcast. The materials we cover encourage adults of all ages, nationalities, and sexualities to open up and embrace their wildest desires and blissful pleasures. You won't find medical advice here, just our personal experiences following the journey of sexual evolution and education in sizzling fun topics that were definitely not taught to us in school, but have wickedly blossomed into reality. We discuss adventures in ethical non-monogamy, kinks and fetishes, exotic places to visit, sexy events, workshops, and tips allow us to seduce you into embarking on new adventures where each day you ask yourself what's your pleasure hello all it's june 2020 and the world is having multiple crises at the same time but we are still here to keep you all amused today we have an interview that was planned long before the latest shit hit the fan but the subject makes it even more appropriate today we think we talked to jet setting jasmine on how people of color see the sex positive world and the results are very eye-opening we couldn't get to the official bliss studio for recording for the obvious reason so the sound isn't as good as usual deal with it here goes As always at Blissbringers, we are always looking for interesting people in the King community. And Mrs. Puppy just pointed me into a, an interesting direction that she has been fangirling about on Instagram. And with us, we have the infamous <laughs> Jet Setting Jasmine. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me on. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining us. We feel so honored. Aww. There's so much that you do, so explain it to all of us. What sure. Um, so I am Jet Setting Jasmine. I am the co-owner of Jet Setting Jasmine LLC with my partner, King Noir. Um, Jet Setting Jasmine LLC is an adult entertainment and adult education company, primarily where we travel the world when we can travel, right? Helping people explore their fetishes and kink. Um, we're also master fetish trainers, again, helping singles, couples, and also on a larger scale, um, providing workshops and safe spaces for people to um, engage in kink and fetishes in a safe way. We are also the co-owners of Royal Fetish Films. Royal Fetish Films is a full entertainment, three-time award-winning production company of adult content. We do place a primary focus on showing uh, people of color engaging in kink practices and fetish play in a way that you don't often see in mainstream um, pornography. So um, you get to see really a full expression of, of lovemaking, just some deep, deep, kinky, nasty, like yummy, yummy smut. I mean, there's like so <laughs> such a variety. And I'm really proud of Royal Fetish Films for showing the diversity in our sex and, and how much our sexual expression can range. And also I am the owner and lead therapist for Blue Pearl Therapy. I'm a licensed clinical psychotherapist and offer um, a full range of services via virtual therapy. That's me. That's what I do day to day. There's a lot there. That sounds like an amazing day to day. <laughs> it can be for sure. You started your own media company. Yeah. Did you feel that the others weren't cutting it? Absolutely. That's exactly why I started. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is that our company is not born out of desperation within ourselves. Our company was born out of the desperation of our loyal fans, friends, other colleagues and artists that were not seeing themselves represented in adult entertainment. Um, we had been traveling the world for a couple of years prior to, and we had consistently been hearing, I would watch more porn if I saw people that looked like me, or if I saw my body represented, or I saw the things I was interested in doing. Um, a lot of times in mainstream porn, you see a lot of negative stereotypes being perpetuated about people of color. Uh, you see a lot of limiting roles where there isn't adequate dialogue or the dialogue is subpar. And we just really wanted to create a platform that 
allowed our clientele that we were that we were seeing to have like good quality porn. So we created it and come to find out a lot of people are looking for this kind of material. You also do workshops. What was it? A pop ups? Yeah, we did kinky pop ups. It, it's really a lot of fun because we get an opportunity to actually introduce people to some pretty basic concepts of kink, you know, like impact play, choking, um, negotiating a scene, navigating the kink scene, meeting people in their local communities that are also interested in kink. We just come, they show up, and then we leave and they stay being kinky with each other. You know, a lot of times people don't even realize that in their own backyard are people that are just like them, interested in exploring one another, interested in exploring different types of kinks. And um, a lot of people don't even know that they have dungeons in their community. We get to find these these spaces, these swinger clubs and, and kink spaces and sex positive friendly spaces and bring people together. The other thing that's really nice about it too is a, a large portion of our clientele are relatively new to kinks and fetishes. So it can be a little discouraging to go in a space that you're not welcome or you feel like you may not have someone to take you under their wing and show you kind of the ropes. No pun intended, but yeah, the ropes, those two. <laughs> <laughs> and so these kinky pop-ups kind of make um, like a, a soft landing into the kink space. Actually, this year we were supposed to start to do the kinky pop-up part two, where those who have attended and feel more comfortable being in kink spaces can actually get into more play. And so where we would be doing more of play parties and allowing people to more um, comfortably engage with one another from less of a demonstration standpoint, but an actual play and, and expression standpoint. So we'll see what happens as you know the world decides that we're allowed to get out of the corner and play again. Yeah, so the people that go to that already have an interest in kink express yeah some do some are, i notice um as of late it's a lot of my friend bought me here and i had no idea what was going on <laughs> <laughs> which you know it's kind of like well i don't find that to be the nicest thing for a friend to do but because this is a completely consensual very much we honor the voyeurs we honor people who are there to learn we honor those that are experts and still get a rush being around people that are vanilla and new and still you know learning about kink it's been really nice also to bring in other experts in in these different countries or states and um, allow them an opportunity to meet people that are new to the kink space. I'm sure you both know that like excitement that you get when you're introducing someone to something new for the first time and welcoming them into your lifestyle. That's just as important for us as veteran seasoned kinksters as it is for newbies for us to share that energy of teaching and learning from each other. That is John's favorite thing. To is take it? Yeah. And, and give them that, what he calls the sampler platter. Mm. This is a, the to zapper we yeah. have on people. <laughs> the to zapper will scare them away. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things that that, that we do, and, and that, that I do in particular, is uh, give intros in crossover yeah. events like swinger events and poly events, yeah. and then start people to introduce in, uh, into a dungeon. I've sort of developed my own style because I basically found that a lot of places that do this mm -hmm. sort of either suck or are too scary. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I've, they, they had a dungeon, and then there's this guy saying, like, welcome to the dungeon, mm -hmm. and, uh, and here's a cross, and, and so-and-so mm -hmm. can tell you about single tail, and blah, 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 which is technically correct, but people stick their head in, and they're like, okay, this is not for me, and they run for the door. It's right? overwhelming. You're, you're absolutely so, correct. So what I do is, like, people come in, and they're like, oh, welcome, you're here for the free spanking, slime right up over there. And guess what? They do it. They love it. Mm -hmm. They need to feel invited. And I do like an, an indirect contact with the, the violet wand, start playing with mm -hmm. electricity. Before you know it, everybody's touching their cells. Mm -hmm. so of course a conversation going so I, like, I like that that's how we met i met him oh, at, a, at a finger party i was not into kink whatsoever okay i will be honest with the, at that point in time i have mm -hmm. like so many people have villainized kink like it's for mm -hmm. women who daddy problems they need this and that and um you know i had an open mind but i had like a you know the stigma sure. that most 
people have. Yeah. And he introduced me to it. And before I knew it, he was the first person I subbed for. Probably, you know, introduced me in a really delicate way. And mm-hmm. then I was like, I wanted more like a little bird in a nest. I was like, give me some more. Give me some more. <laughs> that's but, that's uh, beautiful. What do you think about that? That it's so villainized that people have guilt for even thinking about it or being interested in it? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about intersections because this is something that we are are super passionate about. I'm going to talk about it specifically, um, kind of talk about it broadly, and then I'm going to narrow it down to even how much more challenging this is for some folks that are in marginalized communities to be able to experience kink in a way that's safe, in a way that's fun, and in a way that is non-judgmental. So we have to kind of think about our social constructs and how we get to this place where some sexual activities are considered acceptable and others are not. We see these kind of stereotypes around sex and sexuality perpetuated constantly. You know, it's like, it's fine for a woman to sell a car being sexy, but it's not okay for a woman to be sexy in her household or or something along those lines. We use sex and kinks. Like if you even look at music videos, I, I could probably go back to like the late 80s with Madonna. That's the first thing that comes to mind where we see uh, BDSM and fetishes and that kind of kink style of play and, and garment. We see it in pop culture a lot. However, it's revered as like something that's over there. It's for celebrities. It's for videos. It's for to make you feel fear right? They never kind of talk about the the relationship between pain and pleasure. We have all been colonized sexually to have a very, very thought process around sex being around procreation or around monogamous relationships only. We don't even talk about sex from the space of self-exploration. Many of us come with our religious constructs around even masturbation, right? Some of our first like hangups around masturbation or you're going to go blind or you're going to have hairy palms and shave them, get glasses. (laughs) Yeah. You know, right. Exactly. A lot of these things are taught very early on. And then when we start to talk about when we do start to explore things sexually, like I talked about mainstream porn or even mainstream media, you only see sex presented in one particular way. Very, very straightforward. It's very hetero. It's very for the white, straight, male eyes gaze. Those are the things that are lifted to being acceptable. Um, So what does that do for those of us that are like ready to start exploring sex? It starts to tell us that whatever impulses we may have, any ideas, fantasies, creativity that we have in our own mind are probably wrong and should be silence or you should keep, you know, like, don't tell anybody that you're a freak. Um, There's like a saying, she's a lady in the streets, but a freak in the sheets. So so it's already telling us we can be one way publicly, but we have to keep this self-sexual expression very private. That's why we operate in these very private spaces. Let me just add to that. As a therapist, I remember the book that we practice from the DSM, which we diagnose at some point in time, fetishism was considered a disorder. A lot of kinky behaviors that we now accept as, at least in our lifestyle, as normal and healthy consensual behavior as being considered a disorder. So there's a lot of external factors that really keep people from feeling comfortable to be able to express themselves. Taking it a little further, like I talked about talking about marginalized communities, how the both of you met, like in the swingers atmosphere. I've been to a lot of swingers events, traveled like on the the cruises that they have, a lot of the um, hotel takeovers, and they're a really great time, but they are also very limiting in terms of the type of people that are welcomed. Um, The type of people that feel that are invited, uh, the entertainers, the educators, a lot of times they don't look like me. They are not of color. They are not um, they're not queer. They are not trans. Like some of the the very people that are oppressed sexually are even oppressed in our lifestyle. So we have to really think about that. Do we create open and inviting um, spaces? Do we market to people that are marginalized, do we really want the same level of sexual freedom for others as we want for ourselves? So I kind of challenge the people that are listening to this call to think about your kink spaces and your play spaces. And are you kind of opening that space to be non-judgmental and inviting to others? So I know that was a mouthful, but I do think that we um, have the tendency to 
kind of have a picture of what sex should look like. And that's really what people find themselves judging and comparing themselves to. And then once we do get into the lifestyle, do we create another layer of judgment for those that also perhaps don't look like us? I had the, this sort of the same discussion last time we were in New Orleans, mm-hmm. um, her entertainer, on like the stereotypical person that goes there is yeah. like the, the middle-aged, white, mm-hmm. well-off, hetero yeah. couple. A lot of that is not consciously excluding people. I think it's also the economical factors there. Not everybody can afford to take a week off and spend a couple grand on an an event or Mm -hmm. take a cruise. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has that money to throw around, I think. A couple of thoughts on on that. I do agree with you. Um, I do agree with you wholeheartedly that based on economic structure, you know, you can't get young folks to take a vacation for a week and spend a couple of grand. Absolutely. Um, so, so we do miss the mark when it comes to younger adults. I think that there is this um, sort of blanket idea that the only high earners in our country and our spaces are these white straight couples. And I disagree with that because I do know that you know, when you kind of look at statistically, the the people who have the most expendable dollars are actually gay men. And when we go to these spaces, we see they, they might have like a, a little bisexual meetup group, right? So you'll go and there'll be a little picture in the elevator. And usually the focus is for bisexual women. I kind of reject that idea because I know, we, we all know, we can look at, at the numbers statistically, white gay men have the most expendable dollars. However, they are certainly not marketed to. I'll take it a step further. Majority of my clientele are black women age about 35 to 45, majority. These women have money too. They are traveling. Um, black women are the most educated women in America. Although not, you won't see that by pay standard, but certainly by culture exposure. And I will tell you, I have tried to bring my group to these swingers groups. And you know what the first thing they say to me? The marketing only has white women with blonde hair. I am not interested in spending a week vacation seeing the exact same images that have been perpetuated my whole life as a standard of beauty. So we have to be really careful that we're not thinking that it's the socioeconomical factors that keep people out, we have to be really conscious about the fact of how do we market? How do we let people know that this will be a great week? This is a great way to spend your money. We know Americans waste money on all kinds of shit. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I'm going to say I agree with Jasmine on this one. Even the socioeconomic part, I mean, not to get too deep into things, but that also is connected with systemic racism as well. So like, (laughs) since we're going to touch on stuff, let's like really get down to it. The private events that I have seen, like private events, I've seen more of a mix, but it's only targeting swingers and it's not really targeting kink community. The one thing I would say is because we're in a little bit more of a bubble here in California, Mm -hmm. so you'll see a lot more different racial backgrounds and socioeconomic Mm -hmm. backgrounds. You'll see a lot more gay men in a club. It's Mm -hmm. a little different, but I think that that's a bubble, right? That's not the rest of the country. No, it's not. I agree with you. When I see a swinger cruise or any sort of thing, what I see is a woman with a perfect body that I can't identify with because I've never had that perfect body. I've always been, you know, the, your the body ch- is perfect. I'm Those... gonna go to the <laughs> and I'm going to be alone and who's going to even want and, and when I even got into swinging, those marketing tools made me feel insignificant. I told my husband, I said, there's no, no one's going to want to play with me. So I get that. I exactly get what you're saying. And then you take it a step deeper into the community where people already feel marginalized and then that is an extra layer to yeah. consider there's so many things we need to change obviously we could do better we could do better i mean it's, it's as simple as when you shoot your brochure or your commercial just look does this look representative of all the people that i i come in contact with or maybe that is even the problem right like maybe you know maybe you're not coming in contact with full figure women maybe you're not coming in contact with black women with latina women you know there, there's so many things but i i agree with with you that that is also like oh it's a clothing optional like I'm not taking off my clothes in front of these people and they're only looking at the people that are on the marketing right but when you actually go and I hope new people are listening to this when you actually go like you see 
all mm-hmm. kinds of bodies, right? Um, so they may not be black or brown bodies, but they there are, I remember getting like the biggest boost of confidence my first swingers cruise, because I was like, if she can walk out to the pool naked and you have those cute little dimples on her butt, then I damn sure can take off this cover up. I think there's a lot to gain being in these environments once you get there. But that's kind of the thing. How can we help people cross that barrier to getting there? Because money is not the only issue. I can guarantee you that. True. Why does it have to be a big expensive cruise? There needs to be more cheaper events as well. And and Mm -hmm. to introduce people, and then I, I also think the online events are a great thing because it yeah. lets them kind of poke their head in without being seen. Mm-hmm. Everybody's so afraid of, uh, oh, I'm going to get judged if someone sees me. What if I see someone I know? My thing is always, well, if you see them, then they're there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah, that's true. When I did get into it, I realized that most people were not the perfect bodies. I was expecting yeah. it to be, you know, that everybody's going to be like this perfect body and I'm going to stand out like a sore thumb. But I also found that the community between the kink community and the swinger community is one of the most open communities that I've mm-hmm. ever been part of. They're very mm-hmm. accepting of everything. But there's still like the part where we're not making sure that everybody knows they're welcome, whether mm-hmm. they're gay, straight, lesbian, transgender, people yeah. of that effort needs to take place. I think that we have this stagnated type of um, commercialism that needs mm-hmm. to be adjusted mm-hmm. as well as the way that we live needs to be adjusted and the way that we address each other. I think that um, you need to come out and visit us in <laughs> California. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to. I would be more than happy to. I'm excited to have these kind of discussions because this is how we learn to make our events more robust and exciting. And I think that is more than anything. Like if I'm going to step outside of my primary relationship, give me a buffet, a diverse group. I want more to, I want to enjoy people from all different places. I want to have like these really rich conversations and connections. And the only way to do that and to really get the full, in my opinion, the full benefit of swinging um, and kink play is by making sure that there is a nice representation of people to engage with. Because otherwise, I mean, I can just like keep fucking the people in my in my neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, I know that um, sometimes it's hard to get those two communities together. Like some of the kink community, at least out here, is very like, this is my sub, this is us, and we don't we don't intermingle. Like they don't swing. They're just mm-hmm. kink. And that it's been more and more common over the past five years to see people more intermingling with that. Yeah. And so as a swinger and became a kinkster, I didn't know. I was mm-hmm. I'm like really anxious to get people to try things. What do you think about that, that difference in, you know, the poly community versus kink and swinger and all those communities coming together? Yeah, I was super, super shocked when I entered the space to see that that division, right? Like, oh, we're swingers. We don't kink. Oh, oh we're, we're kinksters we don't swing and just kind of like oh how interesting we are as humans that even when given the freedom of self-expression the freedom to enjoy we still will compartmentalize that has been very very interesting but I'm very proud of our swinger community more than anything introducing like dungeon night right or fetish night and and um having you know like these little small spaces play spaces with the St. Andrew's Cross and a couple of floggers or bringing King and I out to do these demonstrations. I love John's idea of like the free spank. And we do like a spank line where we give, allow everyone to get a taste and also providing education on how engaging in kink and fetish can really expand your relationship or really expand your swinging. Also talking about kind of the science behind how pain and pleasure are related and and what it is that kinksters get from maybe practicing in BDSM. I have found that to be expanding where swingers are becoming more interested in kink spaces. I think that a lot of leaders and content creators in, in our community are doing a good job fusing that and making it kind of like you can swing and engage in some kink stuff. A lot of aspects of swinging are also fetish based like cuckolding, voyeurism, exhibitionism, group sex. That Those are fetishes. I've been to swingers parties where a wife will say to me like, oh, my husband just loves your feet. He comes here to see the women in the high heels. I'm like, that's a fetish. You know, you're in my world. I'm happy to see that we are seeing more of a fusion of the two. I'm very much like you mentioned earlier, um, like John, when when you see that light bulb go off, 
in someone's eyes, it's so beautiful. Even when you see kinksters playing and inviting someone else in, I'm like, oh, they're about to swing. They're about to swing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the worlds really have an, a lot of opportunity to learn from each other. I think the way that we engage in negotiating consent, limits, boundaries in our kink space is so valuable to swingers. Right. So Absolutely. valuable. We've been involved in, you know, some events like uh, in Vegas, Fetish and Fantasy, mm-hmm. which you do have mostly, you have some swingers, but it really is a lot of vanillas using Halloween as an excuse oh. to try things. Mm. For us, like, it's really fun because we're introducing them to something new, but I also found that it's slightly more on the dangerous side because, you know, you have a woman waiting in line yes. to be thanked and flogged and you get her consent to do all the things you do and then you've got a boyfriend down there yelling at you. We experienced <laughs> that this year, didn't we? John. Wow. Wow. You know, yeah. It's wonderful mm-hmm. to introduce them, but it's a whole different way of thinking that you have to be aware of. And, yeah. and you hope that they're going to get something that they kind of take with them and, and grow from it into realizing that this, Hey, this is a fun thing, but it's also so different dealing with people who aren't open-minded who try kink versus swingers that try kink. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I find it very interesting. Like in Vegas, it's more like, Oh, I had two Bud Lights. I'm so tipsy. Oh, I'm now going to try this, right? Using that as an excuse to go on stage. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I also noticed that when I first went to like an event like New Orleans, mm-hmm. that was, I don't know how many years ago in the time of the dinosaurs, there was <laughs> one person who was doing like a workshop that was sort of kink related. Mm-hmm. And then last time I went to there, they were like, oh, these are dungeons one, two, and three. And these are like an entire plan of king sessions and stuff like that. So people are taking to that. Yes, yeah, we did yeah. wrestling, which I really enjoyed tackling my dom. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. I like that, that exchange of, of physical energy in that way. Ooh, I like it. That's an important thing to talk about, the physical energy in this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I People forget about the fact that this energy connection that we all have together, that when you engage in kink, it's really about this energy exchange. exchange absolutely. Somebody or hurting someone necessarily. It is about this exchange of back and forth. And mm-hmm. back mention that how you know the thin line between pleasure and pain it's pain and pleasure it's really just a perception really how your brain is recording it at the time and when you get into it something that like normally if I'm only in the dishwasher and he comes and spanks me I'm gonna get pissed off I mean yep. that's really <laughs> Right now, that is like irritating. But if we're in the mode, that spanking becomes a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree there. You know, we talk about power dynamic a lot when it comes to kink and BDSM. And it is really giving permission. And I think we see so many opportunities for people to feel empowered in kink spaces. And it I think it's so lovely when it bleeds out of their kink life. So, you know, having like an amazing session where you have complete autonomy of your body, the person that you're working with is respecting you. You are so in tune to yourself. Like you said, it's like, I, I know I am not at the dishwasher. I am welcoming these spanks. I am more present in my body in, in, in this moment than I've been all week. All of those things that happen in that energy exchange, you know, we take that into our Mondays. In our Tuesdays, we walk a little bit taller, back a little straighter because we are more connected to to ourselves and feel more empowered within our bodies. I know that's something that people that may be listening that haven't experienced versions of of kink, specifically like impact play or um, dom sub dynamics, may be thinking like, how in the world? But I am a huge proponent for the use of BDSM and kink play to help us in areas outside of our bedroom. So talking about that power dynamic, I Mm -hmm. have found in working with new people that are just trying out kink that, um, and we worked with some couples that sadly had the wrong idea. And and I hate to use the word wrong because everybody's different, but we were working with a couple trying to teach them. And um, we found that, you know, some people delve into something without really doing much research. And the male thought that his job was to make her submit, make her call red. And so we Mm. 
them and they started having so much more pleasure in their pay because she was starting to kind of hate him, you know, on the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He thought, hey, my goal is to make her call red, then I've won. But what I explained to them is the power dynamic is really that the sub has the power. The sub is the empowered person. And I had to learn that myself because I had a totally different um, mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. So I was wondering if um, what you think about that for people of color, do you feel like it's hard, that power dynamic, especially that feeling I'm giving my power and I'm letting somebody mm-hmm. um, do impact play on me or something like that. Because yeah. I have talked um, when we've done interviews, uh, we ran into a lady that says, I'm never letting anybody whip on me because mm-hmm. you know, the history of that of, mm-hmm. of my yeah. people. And, yeah. and so I completely am sensitive to that and understand that. What do you mm-hmm. think about that? Yeah, that's a big issue. And we, we talk about it a lot in our, in our black kink spaces and really introducing people of color to kink. We have been made to limit a huge part of our sexual expression because of the historical context in this country uh, surrounded around one, um, brutality and two, sexualization. Those are very sensitive areas. Our people in this country have been raped, over-sexualized, sex used as a weapon, and also brutalized and continue to be. So our bodies have been owned by someone else before non-consensually. That's the key. The non-consensual attacks that have been placed upon black and brown bodies in this country. We suffer from generational trauma. A lot of people will say, well, that's something that happened. But no, this is something that happened last week. We are not far removed from trauma to our bodies. To be able to allow ourselves the opportunity to have these expressions, we have to create a safe space on top of a safe space on top of a safe space. First of all, that is giving ourselves permission to make decisions for our body that may be very different than what has been, again, pre-programmed, right? Like be a good girl, keep your legs closed. Don't, you know, don't do this, don't do that. We, we all can say in this society have at least grown up with those kind of ideas, but even more so for Black people to have this permission to do what they want with their bodies, to be able to explore and try new things, knowing that they're not going to be taken advantage of, they're not going to be um, hurt. And I think the King Space is um, a really powerful place for us to do that because we practice so much about consent. We practice so, so deeply from the space of having boundaries, right? Like talking about limits and boundary settings and negotiating. And if you use your safe word, you can trust that I am going to stop. You have to do so much unpacking of the colonization of our bodies to even get to the space where we can engage in impact play with a person of color. It really does take a lot of trust building and even trust within oneself that you can say, stop. No, thank you. I'm at my limit. That was fun. I just want to watch like all of these things that you as as white folks take for granted. It's your God given human right. It's not even a privilege thing. It is a God given right that you can do with do whatever you want to do with your body. For us that experience generational trauma and even current day trauma, it isn't a right that we have experienced. So it's kind of like tiptoeing slow, you know. So when I go into a dungeon, for example, First of all, what tends to happen when King and I walk into a dungeon, we're not big leather latex wearers. It's hot. We live in Florida. We like to move a lot. Like that shit is restricting. Looks nice. It doesn't, it's not always functional for the way that we like to play. So we walk in and I don't know if you've ever had this experience where everybody just turns and looks at you and their face is saying, what are you doing here? Even times people have asked, are you here for the event? I have the same lanyard as you. This hotel is locked down. There's no way I could even enter the hotel. How the hell would I have found my way to your dungeon if I'm not supposed to be here? The music is, and and I think we can all agree that music in dungeons can use a lot of work. Like it's sometimes... (laughs) <laughs> like, why does it have to be like this thrash metal? Why is it like got to sound like we're into some demonic uh, moment? This can be very sensual and romantic. I'm so glad that we can agree on that here, yeah. um, because it, it's it's not sexy, it's not inviting, it's quite scary. Like honestly, when I think of some of the music that I've seen in dungeons, it's like the same music that plays in my head when I think of like somebody in a pickup truck coming to like 
do some hard I, I, exactly i'm <laughs> telling you those songs okay i no offense to to heavy metal fans but those songs create anxiety within my body for some reason that the sounds is it's yeah. it's a perpetuation of energy within the body that doesn't match for my kink play right mm -hmm. Practical point of view, if I'm doing a scene, I want to hear what I'm doing. I want to hear what the other person yes. is doing, their mm. mouth, their, 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 that's, their, that's, that's important. Yes. I don't want this, this techno no. blast. Doom, 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 doom. Right, it's either that or the metal, right? Yeah, so, somebody's so that the background nah, nah, nah. I can't do yeah. it. Yeah, it's not comforting for any of us, at least on this call, right? So right. even more so to um, a person of color where that is, it's like, okay, like I can get down with a little bit of rock. Like we're very diverse in our music, but if that's the only thing, I would even go as far as that. I would never want to go into a dungeon where it's hardcore rap. Like that doesn't make me feel sexy either. It's quite, some of the lyrics are quite scary. I think that we can do better about being thoughtful about creating an environment that is soothing to the senses. We have to think about people who've experienced domestic violence, sexual assault, discrimination because of their disabilities. It's important that we look at our space and go, is the lighting inviting? Can you, like you said, John, is it safe? Can I see if I'm making marks that are potentially problematic? The music, is it at a level that I can hear my person use their safe word? Can I have an, a negotiation without having to yell? I mean, it's not a sexy, space for negotiation. To... Yeah, yeah. The things that you find uncomfortable, just times it by 400 to be able to understand how this space or whatever it is that I'm introducing might need to be that much more sensitive for someone who is not a person of color or um, not a person that has never had a traumatic experience. You know, Miss Puppy, I, I thank you for having that sensitivity and not not thinking like they just don't want to play with us or that's just something that they don't do. But it's like, no, I, we really, really would like to be able to experience this full range of sex, sexuality and play. We just need to be able to do it in a safe place and at a safe pace, given our historical context in this. It's time for a very special sponsor. Let's get checked. I like them because they address multiple issues that are common in our communities. The first obvious one is STD testing. You can now get your tests done completely at home without needing to talk to anybody if you don't want to. The second one is even more taboo in many places. Hormonally related sexual performance and wellness. Both men and women can have undiagnosed hormone imbalances that give a negative impact in how well they do during sex. Nobody likes to talk about this. You still don't have to, but now you can actually know if this is the cause of any issues. They mail you a box with a test kit. You can take the sample at home and mail it back. They give you the results via the app in a few days. If you want, you can consult over the phone to discuss any issues and get advice or any prescription you need. Check it out at blissbringers.com slash get checked. The link is also in the show notes. And if you use the coupon blissbringers, you get 20% off. I had the experience of working with Sir Naughty. He is a rigger and rope fetishist out of the South Florida area. Trusted friend, really love his work, like very knowledgeable. I sat down and talked to him about so many things that he takes into consideration working with all of his rope bunnies, including coloration, like he's not going to see certain bruising, right, or reddening on my skin. So he's very, very thoughtful about those type of things. He had suspended me before in the past, but this time we decided to do a play session out in a park. Didn't even think about the optics of this. And he made a beautiful, beautiful tie on my foot. And so it was going to be a one, if you could a, a picture it, a one foot suspension. So I was suspended from just my foot. We're out at the park. What is the thing that he uses to attach the rope to? We use the tree. I'm with a trusted rope fetishist, a white man. My partner is there. My best friend is there. I feel safe. I feel beautiful in this suspension. I feel so proud of allowing myself to have this experience. We videotaped it, watched it back a couple of days later, and I felt a sickness come through me. I couldn't believe that I let a white man string me up a goddamn tree in public. Oh my goodness. It took this beautiful experience that I had, but because of the trauma, the generational trauma that 
we have experienced watching our ancestors and even our common day folk be lynched, it took it out of context for me. I chose to share it. I chose to also share the barriers that we have to being able to experience certain things because of the experiences that we've had in this country. How we kind of enter everything with a double lens, this double consciousness. Again, this is a trusted person, totally consensual. Neither one of us had any of these ideas or these thoughts. But just to give people an opportunity to see how challenging it is for us to be able to experience our sex, our sexuality, our full expression of it because of these traumatic events. And so, so was this triggering <laughs> you or did you feel what, what the impression of it would be? Yeah, that's a, it was it was actually triggering to me. And then when I posted it, a lot of people said, like, I can't walk, I can't look at this. A lot of people said, why would you allow him to do this to you, um, that it is very triggering. And a lot of people appreciated just understanding just how heavy this topic mm -hmm. really is. And we can sort through it. I would definitely engage again with him in a, a session of suspension and bondage. I trust him. I found this interesting because I have a friend who one of the things she likes is what, I, what we call the piñata, where mm -hmm. I literally suspended her in a tree and then flogged her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she likes it. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with liking that. No, right? not at all. So do you feel like you're basically by not being able to do that, you're giving away the power? No, I don't. I am able to do it. I was able to do it. It was it was being triggered after the fact and, and seeing that image. In that situation, I didn't feel powerless. I knew I could call my color and, and he would, you know, have let me down. Um, there was no tension getting into that position or anything like that. But seeing the optic, I've never seen a black woman being strung up a tree by a white man in a positive way. That's very emotional to know that yeah, I did this and had a freeing and this beautiful experience. But this is my first time ever seeing this, this, this situation in a positive light where others have been able to experience suspension on anything. So hang me from this, hang me from that string, you know, but these are the kind of things that, and, and, and I don't have this feeling about Sir Nadi. I feel very, very safe with him, but I couldn't just walk into a dungeon space and allow, or, or into a BDSM space and allow any white man to string me up a tree and not know that he's not looking at me from a negative black body fetishized way. I get um, it. It's an extra yeah. layer of fear. I completely get it because we have a history in this country that's completely different. If that history didn't exist, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I think it's a really important conversation to have because I think this is things that people don't talk about. People in the kink community, people of color, white people, we don't mm -hmm. talk about this. It's uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. hard to be uncomfortable and, and get these things out in the open so we can all move forward together. Yeah. But I get mm -hmm. what you're saying. In the time, in the moment, you were just enjoying yeah. something that is normal to you. But after watching it, you know, generational trauma pops up and what are people thinking and what did I do and how will other people perceive this? And you know him, but if you went and met just with a stranger, yeah. then, you know, at, at a club, you don't know if he has some sort of underlying uh, racism that he wants to do this and 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 um the the problem is is he getting off on stringing up a person of color right right, and, right and so right. but we never ever know what's going on in someone else's head while we're doing we it and what they're thinking i want to tell you about an experience the opposite way that i have mm -hmm. never talked about okay yeah. and that is um we went to fetish and fantasy and a very large black man wanted me to flog him I am very aware. So all I could think of is this man wants me to whip him on in public in front of and like, what will people think? And yeah. I don't want to. And I wasn't comfortable. I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, we're in this moment. It's loud music. It's a public event. He complained that I wasn't doing it right because I couldn't put my energy into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember discussing with him awful. I said, that was awful for me. I yeah. didn't want to do that because I'm sensitive to that. Like you said. You're sure the person that tied you up and everything that he had pure intentions. You trust him. And this man wasn't thinking about it. And it wasn't a trauma to him, but it was a right. trauma for me to be seen doing that as a white person. Yeah, that's you know? fair. My background isn't even from the South. It's not like I have some sort of thing in the history there, mm -hmm. but it's the awareness of mm -hmm. how it's perceived and mm -hmm. how I might be perceived and caring about that yeah. and caring about what he walk away later and do exactly your yeah. I care about that on such a 
I'm getting emotional talking about That's okay. That's good. Away. And so like I let that white woman hit me and, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that about the next day I would feel so heartbroken yeah. about there's a point of discussion here, like, what is the responsibility of the dom? Safety and common sense. Mm-hmm. At a certain point in time, you also have to take yes for an answer. With that, I mean, quite often in kink, you play with taboos and mm-hmm. potentially trauma. You do things like with knives and yeah. rape play and, and choking mm-hmm. and all these things that could potentially be very traumatizing for a thing. Sure. If somebody says, I am into this, I, mm-hmm. I I do want to be suspended and beat, or I do want to be mm-hmm. whatever, right? At a certain point in time, you sort of, you have to trust that that is okay for them. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you to an extent, John. If a person is saying, like, I enjoy these things, can you deliver them to me? Like, yeah. Do we need to have a, a negotiation? We should about any and everything, right? And in, including aftercare. Maybe the situation might involve a little extra aftercare. But I also think, to Miss Puppy's point, Doms also have a right not to engage in play that doesn't sit well with them. Mm -hmm. She can walk away from that experience traumatized. Doms, I say, I use my safe word as a dom too. Sometimes when a person is telling me more and more and more and more and more, a couple of things. One is, are they high on their own chemical supply and, and no longer inside of their body? I have to navigate that. And then there are some situations where I'm just like, I'm not comfortable with getting to this particular level because of a liability purpose, right? Right. Or even my own psychological safety. Right. We typically run into people say, I want a mark. I want a mark. I'm sorry. No, we don't, you know, we're not going to, don't leave a mark. We're just playing with you for the first time. Right. Be any marks. We would not Mm -hmm. engage that way. We would Mm -hmm. engage different on the level. I'm sure you have this with a client that you've been with for a while that there's a different trust. Yeah. There's a different set yeah. of guidelines compared yeah. to someone who's just coming in and new and they're like, make uh, a mark. And then, you know, I want to be king. Yeah, no, uh, not a first day thing. <laughs> no, <laughs> right. It, it's, and, and so we in public events is like we they, they want to mark. We tell them that they're marked. We give them good spanking or whatever. And like, oh, yeah, you got to take mark. Yeah, have fun. Yeah. And, and I, think, I get what you're saying about we do our due diligence and you can't be responsible. Yeah for someone who, how they feel afterward, if you do your negotiations and you do something, I mean, it's not your fault per se. No. Says, I want this, this, and this. And the next day they wake up and they're like, ugh, I feel kind of gross about mm. that. That's not exactly your fault because you mm. negotiated it. But that's one thing John taught me about negotiating. And that is that we always have the discussion. Do you have any traumas that could pop up? Mm-hmm. It's true. Mm-hmm. Have you ever, we we do ask those hard questions because we feel like if we can't talk about that with, we shouldn't be playing with you. We shouldn't. And if they Mm -hmm. say, talk about it, okay, we're not asking for details of what may have happened, but are you on any medications? Do you have any problems? Do you have any injuries? I don't care. I mean, if you don't want to answer it, we don't have to play, right? This is all, Mm -hmm. it's all optional. Yeah. I love that approach. It's a shared responsibility model, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the, The top and the bottom. I'm not psychic. I can't find everybody's traumas and people's traumas might not be obvious. Like like one girl like, oh, come on stage, spank me. And then right. it turned out that it, she didn't clear it with her boyfriend. Like, oh my God, somebody else is That's touching. their relationship. <laughs> right. I completely yeah. agree yeah. with you. I don't hold the gentleman responsible for my visceral reaction the next day or the reactions of my fans. No, and no one felt by any means he was responsible. This wasn't even a dom and sub situation. This was literally a, a rope tying situation. So, so how, um, how does that mm-hmm. map, trying to be a better dom, what am I missing in terms of things, of behaviors, of mm-hmm. better supporting uh, people with color? Mm-hmm. I think the the most important thing is just having the sensitivity. You know, if we can take a a moment and kind of think about the fetishes that you enjoy. Sometimes we're thinking so far ahead, like, what else could I do? What else? Just if we just are more introspective, what are some of the kinks that I enjoy? If I was applying this kink to my submissive that is Black, how might this be misinterpreted? Even just thinking about external optics, how could this be misinterpreted? Okay. Am I aware of how that, okay, maybe I'll just add this as part of my negotiation. I know that you're a woman of color and to the outside, it may look racially charged, but I don't participate in race play. Are you okay with that? Are there any names that are off limits for you? You know, um, sometimes people say things like not even racially charged, like slurs or anything like that. But I've been to these swingers groups and, and somebody's walked up to me and said, oh, you're a nice piece of chocolate. No, I'm a human being. I'm not chocolate. Don't reference me by my skin color. There's no reason to do that. I've had people say, you know, you you have a beautiful complexion. That's nice. 
that's beautiful. I love the way the sun is hitting your skin. That makes me feel nice. But calling me chocolate or brownie or all of these kind of words, they don't sit well with me, but they may sit well with someone who has not been racially targeted by their skin color. And a lot of times people say like, oh, I call her my my vanilla drop all the time. Yeah, well, that's probably okay with her because her skin complexion has never been attached to her survival. So I think there's ways that we can just be a bit more sensitive and we can ask questions without it being concerned. So let me give you another as to be a better dom. There's certain things about our skin complexion that doms do not take into consideration. You have to feel my skin in order to tell if I am getting too much impact because it's not going to show red, blue or green right away. You actually have to touch for temperature, touch for welts. You have to check in a little bit more on me. My face is not going to get red if I'm getting embarrassed or nervous. My chest isn't going to go red. So there are certain things that you have to be open to doing just a little bit more work to determine if I am okay. That's why a lot of people of color don't work with white doms because they are not sensitive to the nuances of our bodies and our skin. I'll give you another example. And this is not just for black women. This is for any woman with a big butt. Sometimes people (laughs) think... (laughs) (laughs) All right. Come on, sister. Sometimes people think just because a woman has a big butt, she can take more pain. Wrong. We're all sensitive in our bodies in different ways. So I do sometimes hear people like, I want to spank that big black ass. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's scary. Like, are you thinking that you can do some extra stuff to me? Because by the way, my butt is really small. But um, (laughs) these are the kind of things that we have to be that much more careful about when we are working with people of color. So I think that's a way that you can be more sensitive. And even like to me, a great dom thinks about things in advance of their sub. There are some things that we can negotiate or bring to our negotiations that our excited sub may not even be thinking about right away. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. Um, Actually, you know, it's interesting. We have actually out here classes that are put on by Master Hines. He is a black dom out here that's pretty famous and he runs classes. And I think it's interesting. He never discussed any of that like you're discussing. Mm-hmm. And I took a flogging class with him mm-hmm. and he didn't cover that. I'm not faulting him for not covering that, but I'm thinking about how important it is to cover that as mm-hmm. he was teaching us to flog and stuff, probably because it's been an uncomfortable subject, right? And people don't talk about it. And I think that's the problem. We don't talk yeah. about it. We're afraid to talk about it. No, you asking is, is beautiful. I wanted to go back to one of the remarks that you made Mm -hmm. on how does this look externally? Yeah. As a dom, you can Mm -hmm. be doing a lot of stuff that scares the muggles, right? Right, right, right. There's stuff that looks very scary. How much of that do you take into account? Because Mm -hmm. at the end of the day... It's about you and that person. You won't be doing anything, right? Yeah. Let me clarify that statement. Thank you for bringing that up. So optically, that's more about an opportunity for you to think about what you may want to discuss with the person you're working with. Not like, oh gosh, what are they going to think? But for example, let's just say me and Cernati, if we took a moment and said, let's be introspective with the work that we're doing. And in order to do that, sometimes we have to look, what would this look like from an outside lens? It's almost like damage control. How can I look at the many ways that this can spin? And we should do that as doms. We should look at if things go wrong, am I prepared? What if this turns out to be traumatic for him? And then I'll feel terrible about that. She took a minute to look at optics. And then based on those optics, she was able to go, okay, I have to be mindful of how I engage with him. Not from, not because of what other people may see, but because this helps her look at like what is going on in context with this person. I it. did play differently with him out of awareness. I did not use the same amount of force. I actually affected his experience because I checked in so much and I was coming up to him and saying, are you okay? Yeah. It's okay. And he's like, harder, harder, harder. Yeah. Yeah. doing it. And I'm like, I just can't. Yeah. So, you know, but that I, conversation prior to could have been able for him to say, I'm very much into race play, or I don't look at you from that perspective. So please treat me equally or, or what it just, it gives us an opportunity to better negotiate. And, and it, it's our before care. 
And then it gives us something to follow up with after. Discussing when when you're doing play between different races, that we should include this in our negotiation, along with asking if you have traumas. This is something we've never talked about or discussed. It's something that we look past. It's not purposeful, but it's lack of education and lack of thinking of those things. And and I don't want to say lack of sensitivity, because I don't think people realize they're not being sensitive, because it's not something they experience, or it's not a trauma that they have in their history. And and exactly. it's so interesting that this timing of this interview, because <laughs> we started talking about this way before everything has really mm-hmm. come to the forefront in the country. Mm-hmm. And I think the timing of this is fantastic. Um, Likewise. This is Emily from Cassidy, and you can find me and hundreds of other sexually social swingers at Cassidy.Blissbringers.com. And that's spelled K-A-S-I-D-I-E. I want to talk about the beautiful work that's part of BDSM, the therapy part. And I'm not sure if you incorporate it. I know that you help people to... Mm -hmm. Like your doming has to do with connecting with someone and helping them be a better person. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about that beautiful part of BDSM that people don't know about because he has helped with things like, what can I help you do to reach a goal, right? And I have Mm -hmm. wanted to shape some years ago his reinforcement, his encouragement, it wasn't like, I'm going to beat you if you don't do what you're supposed to do. Kind of, <laughs> it gets zapped for, you know, eating donuts and stuff like that. <laughs> but I reached my goal with a, a beautiful level of encouragement. And I want yeah. to talk about that part outside of like the physical part, the psychological mm-hmm. part of BDSM, because I also think it's a wonderful opportunity to experience, I, I hate to use the word trauma, but it is a way to experience safe trauma mm-hmm. and what mm-hmm. something might be like. And then afterward, there isn't anger or upset because yeah. it's a different situation and and I have had a talk mm-hmm. with uh, several couples about how don't use this as an opportunity to be a victim with your partner mm-hmm. and when- is like, you know, I let you do this a little further than I would have called red on because I love you. And then Mm -mm. guilt your partner afterward if you do not. So psychological domination is my absolute favorite. Physical domination is fun, but it's only fun until I start sweating and getting tired. (laughs) (laughs) I just love using BDSM and kink to help people meet their goals, to help people recognize patterns in their life, connect with their bodies and When I say connect with their bodies, I'm talking about that mental connection. Oftentimes with people that are survivors of any trauma, disassociating from your body is often the safest thing to do. That disassociation can keep us from experiencing pleasure, experiencing, you know, all of the the beauties of the physical part. Helping people be present and articulate their feelings, articulate their needs. There's so much that happens in a BDSM dynamic that, again, allow us to grow as individuals. You know, when you're talking about um, the dieting aspect, I have a, um, a couple of clients that like 24-7 power exchange where they want me to design what they're eating, what they're wearing. It's a lot of work. Like, first of all, let me just be clear that doms do a lot of work. People always are looking at the sub as like, oh my gosh, there's no way I would be doing all that for someone. And, and it's really an equal partnership. But there is this beauty of helping someone to structure their life. And and then being able to see with this structure and this accountability, I don't think doms get not credit, but it's understood that we help hold people accountable to their own desires, not necessarily our desires. I mean, my desire is that I have a sub that feels the most empowered, that is meeting their goals, that has the highest level of confidence, that is working to the highest level of their competence. Because if they are, they serve me so much better. And and, and that's the give and take. And when I have a sub that feels beautiful in their body, um, when they feel like they are meeting their goals, they are that much more of a loyal and engaging sub. Yeah, we, we definitely use this accountability model. And yeah, the rewards and the punishments are negotiated. It's not like I'm slapping donuts out of anybody's face, unless they like being slapped. <laughs> donut on purpose. The other thing is we do um, a program called Trauma, Drama, and Kink. It's where we actually do take a person's traumatic experiences. And I always preface that BDSM is not a substitute for mental health care. So I want to make sure that that is completely 
clear. It can be a beautiful supplement to mental health care, but it should not be anyone's be all end all for dealing with trauma, PTSD, or any, any other mental health illness. I'll give you an example so that way people that are listening can actually use this. I had a client, she's since graduated and is doing great kinky things now, that was sexually assaulted and during her assault, she was choked. During that that assault, lots of things happened to her, but her trigger that, that comes from that is anything happening around her neck. So imagine just being intimate with a partner, not even talking about kink or anything, like where do people go to kiss, right? They start at your mouth and then they start working down to the neck or a strong embrace with a lingering touch around the neck and chest. Those things were becoming traumatic for her. What was happening is as soon as her partner started to get to her neck, she would disassociate. So at that point, whatever happened to her body happened to her body. This is almost like another trauma on top of a trauma. She wanted to get past this. We use BDSM in the way that we negotiate as an opportunity to allow her to access her body again. It started with having her partner just put his hand on her chest and negotiating. You're only going to keep it there for the count of 10. And once he got to the number 10, remove the hand. So establishing trust. You can tolerate someone being here that you trust for 10 seconds and trusting that they're going to remove their hand in 10 seconds. We did this until she was able to tolerate his hand on her neck for 20 seconds. And this is over a period of time building up to it where we were starting to redefine what having a presence here meant. It no longer meant only that someone was attacking her. It started to mean this is where I can allow someone to have good touch on my body. Yeah, you know, yeah, we're using the neck and we're, we're talking physically, but this is all actually manifesting in how she thinks about touch, how she thinks about autonomy of her body, being able to communicate. She set the numbers, not me. So she was able to say, okay, yeah, 10 seconds. Okay, yeah, I think I'm ready for 20 seconds. These are ways that we get to use kinky spaces to help people access redefining trauma in their brain and then in their body and feeling safe again. For those of you who are into therapy and psychology and concepts and theories, really what we're talking about is exposure therapy in a BDSM space. I think that's fantastic because it's sad to not be able to enjoy a loving touch because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. many of us carry our past traumas like a bag of rocks behind us, you know, Mm -hmm. affecting us in our everyday and our decision making, creating fear. And I think that is such a beautiful thing to get someone past that. I thank you Mm -hmm. for doing that. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. You're welcome. Let's talk about open sexuality with our kids. Let's talk mm, about that. Like talking mm-hmm. like not shaming our children when it comes to sex because yeah. we have these religious ideas that have been used to control us, all of us, right? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. this whole thing about being shamed and feared yeah. and worry. Let's talk about your involvement yeah. in having that discussion. So a question that had come up quite a lot, I've been always very forward about being presenting my full self and part of being my full self is being a mother. We have a 19 year old, a 16 year old and a two year old. People were asking, you know, what's going to happen when your kids find out that you do porn? What are your kids going to think about all this kinky stuff? A part of being a whole person is not compartmentalizing yourself for others. Others include our children. Our children have the right to know who their parents are. I have the the biggest fear is that my children will learn about me from someone else. um, And that will discredit all of the beautiful things that I have taught them if I am a big old lie to them. So I think when parents try to hide their sexuality, and I'm not saying leave the doors open and let the kids see everything. Sex positive parenting is not about being an inappropriate parent. It's about being an honest parent and having a certain level of transparency with our children. So if our children don't know us to be sexual beings, then where will they learn to be sexual beings? This may sound like to our children, every Friday night since we've been quarantined or sheltering at home, we have a date night, my partner and I. And we don't hide it. We don't, you know, like stay up until 3 in the a.m. until the kids are asleep. My God, we have teenagers. They don't sleep. So we actually say we're going to spend some time together take the little kids upstairs and around one o'clock in the morning, we, we usually have our date night from 10 to 1 a.m. And we'll be done at 1 a.m. And they'll say like, what are you guys going to do? What adults do? And we're going to be in our room and the door is going to be locked. So we're not hiding the fact that adults need intimacy and time together because essentially we want our children to be able to have healthy sex lives also and not hide the fact that adults need intimacy. 
really awful things happen in, in secrecy and shame, right? But beautiful things happen when we can be honest and transparent about it. So I think the first thing that we can do as parents, soon to be parents or what have you, is allow our children to see levels of intimacy that are appropriate. We hold hands, we kiss, we, sit, we talk to each other in, in ways that highlight our intimacy. That's one. Two, we start very early in our household with autonomy and consent. If you can teach children now, then you don't have to worry about them being assholes on a swinger cruise that are touching people without their consent. I'm just trying to make our community safe, right? From now until forever. So this means like my two-year-old, when we're hugging him and trying to kiss on him and he's like, no, we stop, just stop. You know, it's like, it's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to impose yourself physically on a child. And I'm not talking about from like, people think like, like, oh my God, like no one should ever disrespect a child in, in the more like pedophilic way. Of course not. But I'm even saying we don't have to even think about the most heinous thing that can happen. We can think about how we violate our children on a day to day basis with come here, give me a kiss, go give grandma a kiss, go hug this person. No, we can actually give our child, no matter how young they are, permission over their body for these voluntary touches. We can do the same. The same thing. My kids, you know, they come up to me and they like want to hug all over me. And I say, hey, guys, I'm not really in the mood for, to be that close. Please stop. So teaching how to be responsible for one another and how to respect each other's bodies. Um, and then the other thing, too, is I teach my children, my girls about pleasure based sex. So what that looks like is instead of saying, no, that's gross. Don't touch yourself. Don't talk about sex. It's it's more like I want you to spend some time thinking about what you like and how you like to be touched, because if you're not aware of those things, how are you going to communicate them openly to your partner when you become older adult? Our 19 year old is as actively having sex and we get to have conversations and she gets to ask me questions because we have never made sex a shameful thing to discuss in our family. I don't want them outsourcing information. I want to be able to help guide them and direct them. We guide, direct, and teach our kids about everything else. Why not sex? We don't do the one conversation thing like, oh, the birds and the bees when you turn 16. No, it's an ongoing conversation. As long as I have breath in my body, I want to be able to have conversations with my children about questions they may have around sex, sexuality, kink. My kids have asked me like, so exactly what does a sub have to do? And <laughs> those are good questions. No? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Or, you know, um, there have been times where I've been putting my laundry in the car and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I have a submissive that's going to do the task of my laundry this weekend. They'll, they'll roll their eyes and go, that is just so weird. It may not sit well with you, but for some people, they get a lot of pleasure at helping mom clean up, you know, and for them, they're like, that's like the weirdest thing in the world. But we can talk about these things and normalize them in a way that doesn't expose them to anything that is inappropriate, but also in a way that shows them they have a variety of options sexually. So they're not like most of us that don't figure out what's on the menu until we're like 30, 40 years old. I love this. You make me think deep. As you're talking, I'm thinking about my own experience as a child. I thought people only have sex to make babies. My parents had sex and then I was born and that was it. Like that's, you know, and the then they really, stopped, right? Cause, yeah. cause we, you know, we, and we, then they stopped. <laughs> this false crap that we've been taught trying to, well, I'll teach them right, even though I did it wrong or, or, or you know, yeah. that came from like a strict billion Catholic background. Me too. <laughs> finding out when my parents were having sex, I remember just being mortified and shocked. So I did things differently. I've always been very open with my children. My daughter identified as bisexual um, at a very young age. We were having discussions. She knew it, of course, always, but she came forward in about fourth grade. So we had very open discussions. Mm -hmm. um, she now she now has corrected me. She says, Mom, I'm no longer bisexual. I am a lesbian. I am fully in, aware of who I am. You know, I wasn't prepared. I was open about sex with them and told them, you know, it's for pleasure. It's not a shameful thing. You're not going to go to hell for mm -hmm, pleasure mm -hmm. or having pleasure with someone else. I want you to be safe. I don't want you to engage in something you're not emotionally ready for. We had those discussions. Mm -hmm. But when my daughter pulled me aside and said, can you explain to me how to masturbate and what masturbation is? I was like, oh. <laughs> 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 so it's important to be prepared it for that. Is. Classes on mm -hmm. right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank this was you. amazing. And I thank you so much for having 
this conversation um, with us and time with us. Yes. Where can people find out more about you? Thank you so much. I'm on all forms of social media under Jet Setting Jasmine. You can take a look at my website, jetsettingjasmine.com. You can see some of our films at royalfetishxxx.com. And you can also, if you're interested in the more therapeutic side of things, bluepearltherapy.org. Thank you so much. This was a very passionate Thank conversation. I look forward to, to hearing how we can continue to have conversations like this and maybe play sometime soon. Ooh, I like that. You gotta come visit us in California. This is the part of the episode where usually I make jokes, tell you to like and subscribe, and visit us on blissbringers.com. That's what we are supposed to do as a good podcaster. You're also not supposed to talk about anything even remotely close to politics. Fuck that. There are important elections coming up. There are only two sides to this. You only have two options. No, really, you're living in a fantasy world if you think otherwise. Nobody likes it, but we have to admit to it. This is the time for you to think, where do I stand on LGBTQ rights? What do I think about the treatment of people of color? What about police violence? And then I want you to decide what side you are on by doing just a tiny bit of research. One side has consistently tried to remove rights from gay and trans people. One side has used literal Nazi rhetoric. One side has laughingly endorsed police brutality on national TV. One side has publicly made fun of vets, people of color, women and the disabled. Do you want to be on that side or the other side? There's no room for nuance here. If you made your choice, go to vote.org and check your voter registration. And if you disagree, go to my Twitter and tell me what my problem is. I'll give you double the money back you paid for this podcast. All names mentioned in this show are either fictional, taken from public record, or held by people who have given their explicit consent to be mentioned.